Ten seconds, Super. Kiss my hot leg. I want you to hold it between your knees. There's never a cop around when you need one. You got a little pretty male thing. Well, do you, punk? I'm gonna nail you for picking your feet and pick up you. This cat shop is a bad mother. Shut your mouth. Welcome to Vintage Video's 12 Days of Christmas, where as a special treat this year, we'll be reviewing all of our Patreon poll options for December of 1973, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today marks the 50th anniversary of the release of The Last Detail. On December 12th, 1973, it was written by Robert Towne, based on a novel by Daryl Ponison, directed by Hal Ashby, and released by Columbia Pictures. In 1970, Daryl Ponison's novel, the Last Detail was published, and before it even hit store shelves, producer Jerry Ayers had snatched up the film rights. He put Robert Town to work adapting the story to the screen, who tailored the Bedusky character specifically for his friend Jack Nicholson. Ayers leveraged his previous role, consulting on Bonnie and Clyde's production, to land a distribution deal from Columbia. When they finally got the script, they were weary to release a film with so many F-bombs, but the creatives involved insisted that this is how sailors talk. Ultimately, Nicholson's official attachment smoothed over any reservations they had. They were also able to persuade the filmmakers to shoot a less expletive-laden version for each scene for TV broadcast purposes, and they wound up basically shooting the film twice over. So there's like a clean version of every scene. Just dub it. Yeah. Like Nobody w- cares. Yeah. Someone, someone wanted to watch the last detail, the clean version? Dub it. Ayers passed the draft to Altman first, on his way to Ashby, who found it more appealing. Again... Columbia expressed reservations, but approved Ashby when the budget dropped to $2.3 million. Columbia's ideal casting was Burt Reynolds for Badusky, Jim Brown for Mule, and David Cassidy for Meadows. Bud Court, fresh off of Ashby's Herald and Maud, reportedly begged to be considered for the Meadows part, and seems like the perfect fit to me, Mm -hmm. but Ashby turned him down. Yeah, I would have loved that. That That's the way he's described in the book, as being a frail childlike character well, i think that it's important to find him really endearing yeah and maybe randy quaid would have come off more endearing because he wasn't well known at this point when mm. he made this film but i just like i can't associate him with like this this young kind of adorable lovable character that i think this person is supposed to be yeah he definitely doesn't look underage i feel yeah. like that makes it weird later in the story but he because w- he was like six four, but he was really young at the time, and I do feel like he feels very harmless and like a child, basically. Yeah, and and I agree with that. I just think that it would have made more sense for the person to look. I, I think that I think the look didn't really go with what the character was supposed to be. Yeah, I, I've also spent you know four decades cultivating a Randy an opinion Quaid. of Randy Quaid yeah, yeah. That's what, but that's what I'm saying is like I, I'm definitely influenced by all of that in my opinion of how he doesn't fit this yeah. character <laughs> I mean earlier this same year 73 we saw him as a wrestler in Paper Moon and mm-hmm. he seemed 10 years older than this character Robert England also auditioned for the Meadows part and by the end it was apparently down to Quaid and John Travolta with Quaid eventually winning out Nicholson was pushing hard for his friend Rupert Cross to play Mule but Cross had unfortunately been just diagnosed with cancer and was not up to working in the film, eventually succumbing to the disease in March of 73. When Ashby turned in his cut, there were 60 to 70 F-bombs, and they spent six months arguing with Columbia over which instances to cut before a wildly popular test screening in San Francisco proved Ashby's point. The film debuted at the Cannes Film Festival, where it was nominated for the Palme d'Or, and Nicholson won Best Actor, at which point Columbia agreed to release Ashby's cut as desired. At the Oscars, Nicholson, Quaid, and Screenwriter Town were all nominated. Nobody won. In 2004, the original author, Ponison, composed a sequel entitled Last Flag Flying, and filmmaker Richard Linklater was eager to direct. Both Nicholson and Quaid were on board to reprise their characters, but Otis Young had since passed away, and Morgan Freeman was briefly considered to replace him as Mule. The project lay dormant until 2017, when the semi-sequel was officially announced with Brian Cranston, Lawrence Fishburne, and Steve Carell as renamed versions of Badass Mule and Larry, but we'll discuss that at the end. 
Even though it's a Columbia film, the opening titles play out over a military drumline that typically plays over a 20th Century Fox logo. I kept waiting for the horns to jump in. Mm -hmm. We see a sailor strolling across the grounds of a naval base to the transient personnel office. He calls around for someone named Badusky and finds Jack Nicholson as Badusky sleeping in a chair in a rec room. He's being called to the office of the MAA, the Master at Arms. Tell MAA to go fuck himself. Sit right away. A few doors down the hall, the same sailor delivers the same message to a man named Mulhall, played by Otis Young. Mulhall puts up the same fight. When you're in the Navy shit, bird, you're in transit, nobody knows where the fuck you are. Now go tell that MAA to fuck himself. I ain't going on no shit detail. So what I thought was happening here was this guy needed to find someone to do a dirty job. Do a and job. And he's like, he's like, Badusky, they, they said they need you. And Badusky's like, I'm not falling for this again. And so right. when he goes to Mulhall, he's like, oh, Mulhall, they need you. Yeah. It seems like he's just passing it down the line. Mm -hmm. Eventually, Mulhall and Badusky show up at the office of the MAA, played by Clifton James. He tells them how lucky they are to have landed a cakewalk detail as chasers, a nickname for sailors enlisted to escort other sentenced servicemen to the brig. Nicholson's good friend Dennis Hopper would later direct a film called Chasers with a similar plot to this one except the prisoner is a woman. The man they are assigned to escort caught an eight-year sentence in a Boston prison and they assume it must have been some terrible crime. In fact, all he did was steal some money, and not even that much. Forty dollars? Forty dollars. Shit. You're shitting me. I wouldn't shit you. You're my favorite turtle. The MAA elaborates that the money was in a box for donation to a polio charity, and further, that this particular polio program is a pet project of a wife of a higher up on the base. But Dusky thinks that the trip will take a couple days tops, and they've been granted a week's per diem. He suggests pooling their money to spend on the way back. They sign the paperwork to collect their prisoner, Meadows, played by a young Randy Quaid, and each of them is given a service weapon with one clip of ammo. Well, Randy's not given one, but the other <laughs> <laughs> you don't give the prisoner a gun. It's a bad idea. We stopped doing it <laughs> after an incident. The MAA's second in command drops the three men off at a Greyhound station. Oh, so this was really like, they're, they're putting them on a bus? Yeah. Like, you can't borrow, like, a car from the motor Yeah, you just had or... a car that said Navy on the side of it. Just drive this to Boston and turn yeah. around. They walk to the back row of their bus, and Badusky undoes Meadows' handcuffs. A few hours into the trip, Meadows is suddenly eating a candy bar and claims he's had it the whole time. Sometime later, he conjures another bag of candy and again explains he brought it with him. When they stop at a station between buses, we see that these chasers are not keeping a close eye on their prisoner, and he manages to pocket more snack foods from a concession stand. He pretends to help an old woman push a grocery cart and swipes a few of her carrots as well. <laughs> it's clear the $40 he stole was a part of this same unconscious kleptomania. On the next bus, or I guess it's a train now, yeah. Mulhall explains that he answers to the nickname Mule, while Badusky says most people call him Badass. The fact that they're allowed to carry weapons onto a Greyhound bus and then onto a train. I know it's the 70s and I know that they're military, but damn. Yeah. It's just because they're they're transporting a prisoner. So like if he runs, you're they they can draw their weapons and start firing. Yeah, they should. Gun train. Bullet train. <laughs> That's what you call it. <laughs> they ask Meadows about the crime for which he will spend eight years in jail and he admits that he didn't even get to keep the money. You mean to tell me they gave you eight years and a DD for forty dollars and you didn't even get it? <laughs> Boy, they really stuck it to him, didn't they, Mule? Well, if you're caught stealing... You don't typically get to keep the money. <laughs> yeah. It's like, <laughs> it's like, all right, you're going to jail, but it's, $40 is fair. Here you go. <laughs> Badusky asks if Meadows had a record before his latest crime, and he admits to a couple shoplifting charges from police as a child, but nothing serious. Badusky assures him that with good behavior, his eight-year sentence will be six years maximum, which is still a long fucking time for $40. A few hours later, the prisoner has fallen asleep, and Badusky notices carrots protruding from his sleeve. When they wake him to ask about them, Meadows suddenly jumps up and runs full speed down the aisle, but he doesn't get far before he's tackled by his chasers because he's on a moving train. Yeah. <laughs> Where's he going to go? Was this like, was this just instinctual? Like, I'm going to run because I've been caught with a thing? Mm -hmm. Because he can't, he really can't go anywhere. They drag him back to his seat. He cries and apologizes for the money he took and explains he does this all the time for stuff he doesn't even need. 
Mule and Badass decide to take Meadows off the train at their next stop to give him room to calm down. They take him to a restaurant for a meal while they wait for their next train. Mule worries that they'll miss the train, but Badass doesn't care because they have so much extra time. Meadows is excited at the prospect of a cheeseburger with the cheese melted over the patty, but when it comes to their table, the patty and cheese are cold. Badass won't let Meadows settle for the burger the way it is. Send it back. It's all right. Send the goddamn thing back, Meadows. You're paying for it. Eventually, he has to ask the server to fix the order himself. Melt the cheese on this for the chief, would you? Thank you. When they still have time left over, Badass suggests stopping for a beer on the way back to the station. The bartender at the place they duck into says he doesn't serve kids like Meadows, and he's annoyed enough that the law makes him serve African Americans like Mulhall. Mule tells the man to shove the beers up his ass, and the guy reaches for a weapon under the bar. Badusky tells him to drop it, and the guy threatens to call Shore Patrol on them. I am the motherfucking Shore Patrol, motherfucker! I am the motherfucking Shore Patrol! Now give this man a beer. Uh, I also like that it's like, it's like you put take your hands off that wood. It's like how you know I got something bigger because I was here last. last like you last laid month. that thing up against somebody's head. <laughs> I know you ain't got nothing more than wood under this table. But the whole time he's like waving a gun in the guy's yeah. face. It, but it reminded me of a scene in King of the Hill where this door to door salesman comes and Hank says something. He's like, "Are you calling me a liar?" And Hank leans over to the umbrella. Uh, he's <laughs> like, "It's like you better have something stronger than an umbrella." Nine iron. You have a good day, sir. <laughs> the men run laughing from the bar, having scared the shit out of this bartender, and hours later we see them chugging beers in a dark parking structure. Badusky offers a toast to Batman, Superman, and the Human Torch, and decades later, Nicholson would kill one of their parents as Tim Burton's Joker. <laughs> <laughs> Mule thinks they should take these beers onto the train so they don't miss the next leg of their trip, and is furious to learn that the train left 15 minutes ago. Badusky suggests they sleep for the night and leave first thing in the morning. Later, in their hotel room, Badusky tries to give them a lesson in signaling, but they don't want to hear it because they're watching a movie on television. So he does a quick signal for F-U-C-K and then Morse code for the letter U before sitting down. After the movie's over, he tests Meadows on some signaling that he's taught the boy, and he seems impressed with how quickly Meadows is picking it up. Must have a flair for this sort of thing. Some people do. I do, for instance. I, I have a flair for this sort of thing. Badusky is starting to get annoyed at Meadows' complete lack of self-advocacy. He tells him he needs to get madder and start punching people. He invites the kid to punch him, but Meadows won't do it. Badusky punches the kid's lights out, by which I mean he literally punches a hotel lamp to the point of the bulb exploding. The next morning, Badusky tries to orchestrate a detour so that Meadows can swing a little off track to see his mother before he goes into the break. When they get to Mrs. Meadows' place, nobody answers the door. Mule and Badass allow the kid to walk a couple doors down to talk to one of his neighbors, Mrs. Esposito. It takes a few seconds before Mule freaks out, realizing they've just released their prisoner. They find him a few doors down, talking to the neighbor just as he said he would. Badusky trusts the kid more than Mule does. The neighbor tells Meadows that his mom is gone for the day, and they head back to the train station. As they roll along, Badusky tries to come up with more ways they could shorten or avoid a six to eight year sentence. He suggests advising Meadows' mother to write letters, but Mule insists it'll do no good. Look, either we let him go or he lives with it. And we ain't about to let him go. Understand? Meadows starts crying and asks if he can go to the restroom. Mule and Badusky argue at the table for a second, and then Mule goes to pound on the restroom door to check on their prisoner again. But he's there. He's just crying in the bathroom. Mulhall tells Badusky they have to stop treating this kid like a friend and get back to standard operating procedure. All the fun and games are only making this job harder. While they wait at the station for the next train, Badusky sees a group of Marines head into the bathroom together. He removes his shore patrol armband and puts it in a locker with the rest of their luggage before following them into the bathroom. The Marines start making fun of him, and he turns to take them all on alone, just as Meadows and Mule come in to join the fight. Our protagonists win and run away right into traffic before taking a taxi away from the station. They stop at an Italian sausage place and then another bar while they wait for the next train. A dart player sitting on a bar stool with a beard and sunglasses is being played by the director himself, Hal Ashby. Yeah, I was always on the lookout for him. Yeah, because he, he has cameos in a lot of his bigger films. Mm -hmm. Badusky is drawn into a game of darts for money, and Mulhall warns him they might be hustling him. We skip forward some time, and Badusky has won $67 off the man in sunglasses. From the sidewalk, they can hear rhythmic chanting coming from somewhere, and they try to guess what the voices are saying. Oh, I hear it too. What the hell is an Indiana dog? That 
Yeah, that's the goddamnest thing I ever heard. <laughs> I love the face Jack Nicholson's making where he's trying to like figure out what he's like showing his teeth and being weird. They follow the sounds to an apartment where people are chanting as though in some sort of Harry Krishna group. Outside the door, there's a pile of shoes on the ground and a paper sign on the wall reads, Nishi Ren Shoshu. Inside, they find a crowd of people on their knees praying toward one end of the room. For some reason, the three of them stand in the back of this room and watch the entire Japanese-infused church service unfold. One of the followers is played by an early film appearance from Gilda Ratner. The ceremony ends with a big musical number, and then the guys are back out on the street again. Somehow, in their time there, Meadows has memorized the chant already and practices it in case it works. Badusky drags his friends to a porn shop. Yola in the canyon. And he tells Meadows stories of prostitutes from his past. She had a glass eye. She used to take it out and wink people off for a dollar. We cut to Meadows getting a custom dog tag made, and later he's ice skating at Rockefeller Center. Do you guys recall the last time we saw the ice rink at 30 Rock? I'm struggling to think of anything. A woman was meeting her husband for lunch. The woman was played by Audrey Hepburn. Oh. Yeah, what was the name of that movie? <laughs> it's one of those titles. <laughs> mm -hmm. I see like all three of us chuckled at that. Three friends, four friends, six friends, ten friends. <laughs> they all laughed. They all yeah. That was they all laughed? Yeah. I think. Or only <laughs> when or only when they laugh. No, you know? no, 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 that was the one that was, that was based on a play. <laughs> At a coffee shop later, Meadows is unconsciously chanting and is approached by a woman named Donna from the same church, it turns out. She asks what he was chanting for. Go ahead, Meadows. Tell her what you're chanting for. A girl? <laughs> That's okay. You can chant for anything. Donna drags him away to a table across the place to meet her friends. When he returns, Meadows brings good news. You guys, uh, drop your socks and grab your cocks. We're going to a party. Yeah? Huh? Do you guys recall the last time we heard the phrase, drop your socks and grab your cocks? No. I don't at all. Two episodes back. Was it really? Wow. Unless I'm totally wrong. I didn't check. I feel like you may be wrong. What? Two episodes back. Lady Snowblood. <laughs> <laughs> More recent than that. Oh, my God. We joked about recording it today, and you forgot that we already had. Serpico? That's right. <laughs> I don't know. I do not remember that line. I'm pretty sure that he says that when they're walking into the room where he's introducing him to his new partner, the one that's, like, laying in the bed. Mm. Hey, drop your cocks and grab your socks. What the fuck is this? Badusky corners a girl played by Nancy Allen and flirts with her about his time in the service, but she doesn't seem into it. Mule is for some reason being asked about his opinion of President Nixon and is supremely bored with the political conversation. These hippie folk are pretty disgusted when Mulhall admits that he'd go to Vietnam if he were ordered to. Even though he was already wearing Vietnam service ribbons. Right, yeah. <laughs> You'd go back, you mean? When Donna learns from Meadows that he got eight years for stealing $40, she offers to help him escape his chasers. But not in like a real way. <laughs> she leads him upstairs to her room and instead of sex or escape... She kneels to chant with a prayer that he can escape these men. We jump forward a few hours to tonight's hotel room. He's still in custody. She did offer that she has a friend in Canada. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but so, that's not going to help right here, right now. No, no. I thought she was going to take him upstairs and let him go out the window and pretend like she was with him, like make moaning sounds so they would think they were having sex until it was too late to catch up with him. But that's not what she did. She was just like, I'm going to say my weird code words. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to whisper Game Genie codes to the ether. And then you're going to escape magically. The next day, they are two hours from Boston when Badusky insists they get Meadows laid before he's locked up. Yeah. Uh, Jack Nicholson says he's 18. He won't be 26 until he gets laid again. It's like, I don't think he knows how prison works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they jump into a Boston cab and Badusky asks the man for a decent local whorehouse. Well, we could really use the services of a decent whorehouse. You know what I mean? One that don't hate GIs. Sizable tip in it for you. Say the tip I get at the other end. Turns out their driver is a former mine sweep, so he's willing to help some fellow sailors out. The driver also happens to be the film's DP, Michael Chapman, who coincidentally goes on to light a little film called Taxi Driver. And he's playing a taxi driver. Isn't that crazy? 
When they reach the place, they see other customers on their way out. One of the young prostitutes here is being played by an early turn from Carol Kane. When Meadows is given his pick of the women, he chooses her. Badusky hands the girl some cash and tells her to make it count. Make it a good one, honey. It's got to last a long time. He slaps her ass and Meadows follows her into the next room. She unzips his pants and he finishes before they've even done anything. When the girl explains that's all she was paid for, Badusky offers to pay for a second round. We see the aftermath of round two, and Meadows asks if, in exchange for the cash he's got left, he can just look at her, since he can't afford a third round. We jump forward to the last day of their detail. They're trying to think of a way to spend their time before 1800 hours and the drop-off. They decide on a picnic in a snowy park, and they break frozen branches for tinder to cook hot dogs on a park barbecue. Once they get the hot dogs cooked, Badusky admits he forgot the buns, so they just raw dog these cooked dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Not with their butts. Oh, God. <laughs> Just dip them in the mustard. Stop. You're making it worse. <laughs> Badusky and Mulhall drag their feet completing the mission, and suddenly Meadows is jogging away from them across the park. He turns to face them and uses Badusky's signals to form the words bye-bye before booking it into the snow. But he doesn't spell it correctly. No, yeah. but neither did Nicholson earlier. He was like B-Y-B-Y when, mm -hmm. he, when they're walking away from the church house. I forget which house. As they chase the kid down, they pop the clips into their service weapons, and it looks like we're headed to a very dark place. Badusky catches up quick and pummels Meadows into the snow before turning around to take the kid in. After they've turned him over, Mulhall and Badusky are questioned about the prisoner's bloodied face from their last scuffle in the park. They're lectured for abuse of power and ask if the prisoner tried to escape. Not exactly. That's a little vague, Badusky. Either he did or he didn't. Which is it? You don't have to look at him for the answer. Which is it? He didn't. He didn't what? He didn't try to escape. He didn't try to escape, sir. He didn't try to escape, sir. The man receiving the prisoner here tries to give them shit about not having all their paperwork in order, and they ask to see the XO. The man gives up the argument and excuses them from his office. Yeah, he, he doesn't want this to roll uphill right? and have someone come with, like, you came to me with this crap? Yeah. They were just asking for hugs and kisses. I yeah. don't understand. <laughs> just give me your XO. <laughs> <laughs> As they walk away from the Portsmouth base in Boston, they discuss their travel plans on the way back. Sounds like they're splitting up for their return trip, but they'll meet back in Norfolk. Yeah, maybe our fucking orders have come through. Another military drum beat bounces onto the track, and we fade to black for the closing credits. They could have driven this distance in one day. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I don't understand why they were given five days and a bunch of money. Like, the it's cost, called military The yeah. cost waste. of renting a car would have been far less than per diem for all three of them for a week. Yeah. Unless that the per diem is to cover the costs of buying bus and train tickets. They're, they're so in the military habit of spending every penny that you're given mm -hmm. so that you get given the same amount the next time. <laughs> well, and I get, I'm assuming that the reason that they're, they're wanting to spend all their per diem is that whatever you don't spend, you have to give back. Right. But I, I think the original plan was it'll only take us a day or two to get there. Mm -hmm. Like, we'll go up there in two days but we won't drop the kid off until it's been five days so that we get his per diem for the whole time too. Mm -hmm. Like they were planning on spending the kid's money without him. Right. Mm -hmm. But then they became friends with him and decided they were going to make the trip a little bit more exciting. Basically they decided they were going to squeeze the next eight years of his life into this road mm -hmm. trip. Changes from the book. Uh, the most significant one is that Badusky does not survive the book. It's what? mentioned offhand in the epilogue that after turning in their prisoner, Badass and Mule went AWOL, and Badass was knocked unconscious and eventually died by another member of the Shore Patrol. So he got in a fight with somebody and, and punched to death. Hmm. Nevertheless, his character is resurrected to appear in the second book, which was ultimately adapted by Ponison and Richard Linklater into Last Flag Flying. So the sequel film, uh, which is... A spiritual sequel, I guess, because yeah. they don't have the same names. They're not supposed to be the same people, but it's supposed to be basically the same people. They're obviously played by different actors. In the film, Brian Cranston is the Badansky character, renamed Sal Nealon. Lawrence Fishburne is Mulhall, renamed Muller. 
and Steve Carell is Larry Meadows, renamed Larry Shepard. But also Shepard, Meadows. Right. Like it's like- and Mulhall Muller. And there's a joke in there about someone mistaking him for a mullah, like a mm-hmm. Muslim religious person. And so he gets like tailed by Homeland Security for a scene. It's very weird. So Larry comes to visit Sal at a bar that he runs now. And the two of them basically head out to collect Muller, who is now a minister. Larry asks these two men to join him on one last mission. His son has been killed serving in Iraq, and he would like them to accompany him in the transport of his son to Arlington Cemetery from Dover, where the the bodies are received typically. The cast do a pretty good job of emulating the team. I think Brian Cranston feels like Jack Nicholson in the movie, um, and I think Morpheus was the right choice mm-hmm. to follow up in the mule role. The only one that I feel like is kind of a strange choice is Steve Carell, yeah. but he's still very like mild-mannered, sweet guy. Um, and he just wants to do right by his son and the memory of his son. Much much like Last Detail, it's it's a very somber movie, mostly uh, talking and travel. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I liked I like I mean I like both of these films. Yeah, I watched Last Detail with my dad. He was he was former Navy. Um, so anything he saw that was Navy related or <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> he was pointing stuff out, it's like oh, do you see the see that patch on his arm? That means this. He's, I was like, oh, good. I, I was I was familiar enough to recognize some of the stuff uh, on, on their uniforms again yeah. from stories from him. But, uh, you know, he had seen this movie previously uh, as well. And we also watched uh, Last Flag flying together. Did he realize it was a sequel to The Last Detail at the time? Uh, No, no. But uh, I, I, I said it to him after the fact. Yeah. Well, and they also they, they sort of introduce an incompatible backstory where – the three men had served together in Vietnam and there was some sort of an incident where they basically got another member of their platoon killed. And so they go to see that person's mother to speak with her before Mm -hmm. they go to the funeral and everything. But um, aside from that, it fits pretty well as a sequel to this. And uh, it's it's an enjoyable movie. I I think it just gets a little overcomplicated, but I think they just wanted to let Ponison do what he wanted with the story. And so Link Ladder got his way. But yeah, that's uh, the last detail. I would give it a thumbs up. I've I've enjoyed this movie every time I've seen it. I, I like Hal Ashby stuff. It can be hit or miss, but I, I enjoyed this one. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a fine movie, I guess. It's just not my cup of tea. Like, there's just not much for me in this film, but it's competently made. The acting's good. I really uh, like the performances, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I don't think you could go wrong with this cast, but it's just, uh, yeah. It's one of those movies that it's just like not a lot happens. They're yeah. literally going from one place to another, and it's it's about the experience along the way. But I love this this wired version of Jack Nicholson. That I I feel like we really only see it in this and at the start of One Floor of the Cuckoo's Nest. Mm. But otherwise, he's usually like very intimidating and scary the whole time. But here, he just feels like you know he's just out to have Manic. a good time and go yeah. crazy and just do whatever feels crazy and fun. Yeah, and uh, and he has that youthful exuberance where where he really is just trying to make everybody happy at the same time. Well, um, so does the Joker. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, he wants everyone to smile at the yeah. yeah. He, he developed the whole line of products just to do it. Yeah. yeah. That's true. Sweet guy. <laughs> the Joker. <laughs> Our director here was Hal Ashby. This was his third film after The Landlord and Harold and Maude. Harold and Maude had just bombed real hard. Like, did it really? It did terrible in the box office and the reviews were scathing. Which is insane because yeah, it's probably it's... his most beloved film now. Later, he directs Shampoo, Being There, and so far on the show, Secondhand Hearts, which is not Ugh. great. Um, and as I said, he played a, a dart player in the background of this film. The writer was Robert Town, who previously did some uncredited writing on Bonnie and Clyde and McCabe and Mrs. Miller. The following year, he wrote probably his most celebrated work, Chinatown, with star Jack Nicholson again. Later, he wrote Shampoo, Orca, Heaven Can Wait, Grace Stoke, Legend of Tarzan, Lord of the Apes. In the 90s, he also wrote a couple Mission Impossible films, the first two Mission Impossible films. Writer Daryl Ponison, he also wrote the screenplay for our recent season two finale, Taps. He wrote Vision Quest, School Ties, and later he co-wrote the sequel with Link Ladder. He also wrote a novel and screenplay for Cinderella Liberty, adapted into the 1973 James Conn film. Which means you have to be back before midnight. That's the rule. Is that what Cinderella Liberty means? I believe so. The music came from Johnny Mandel. He previously scored The Russians Are Coming, The Russians Are Coming, and MASH. Later, he scores a couple Disney titles, Escape from Witch Mountain, Freaky Friday, and so far on the show, Baltimore Bullet and Caddyshack. Next season, he does Death Trap, Author, Author, and The Verdict. 
The cinematographer here was Michael Chapman. This is his first cinematographer credit. And as I said later, he lights Taxi Driver after playing one here. He lights Hardcore and so far on the show Raging Bull. Later, he lights Steve Martin double feature Dead Men Don't Wear Plaid and The Man With Two Brains. And later, The Lost Boys, Michael Jackson's Bad Music Video, Scrooged, Ghostbusters 2, Quick Change, Kindergarten Cop, Space Jam, and Evolution. So a lot of Ivan Reitman there on the end. Yeah. The editor here was Robert C. Jones. He previously cut It's a Mad, 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 Mad World, Tobruk, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, Paint Your Wagon, and Love Story. After this, he cuts Shampoo, Heaven Can Wait, See No Evil, Hear No Evil, and Bullworth. Jack Nicholson played Badusky. We just had him in Reds, where we mentioned that he got his start on a bunch of Roger Corman stuff, and then he exploded after Easy Rider into titles we've discussed like Five Easy Pieces, The Shining, Postman Always Rings Twice. He also shows up in Carnal Knowledge, Tommy, Going South, which he directed himself. He's got a bunch of nominations and wins that we just went over. He followed this immediately with one of my favorites from him, Chinatown. He had just turned down the Redford part in The Sting to appear in this film, and later he and Redford both lost their Oscars to Jack Lemmon's performance in Save the Tiger this year. Nicholson was nominated again the following two years for Chinatown and Cuckoo's Nest, finally taking the statue for the latter. Otis Young played Mulhall. We've seen him so far in Hollywood Nights and Blood Beach. He was Piano Dosi, the detective on the case in Blood Beach. Randy Quaid played Meadows. This is his only Oscar-nominated performance. He's Cousin Eddie in the National Lampoon Vacation movies. He's Ishmael in Kingpin. He's Russell, the savior of the earth in Independence Day. We've seen him so far with his brother Dennis in The Long Riders. He was Jay, the adult guy with a teenage bride and foxes, and as one of the GM employees looking for escaped robots in heartbeeps, and as a wrestler in our Patreon review of Paper Moon. Clifton James played the MAA. He was Carr and Cool Hand Luke. We saw him last in our Patreon review of Live and Let Die as J.W. Peppa. That's right. He returned for the following Bond film, Man with the Golden Gun. He appears in Juggernaut, Silver Streak, The Bad News Bears in Breaking Training. He had a scene deleted from Cabo Blanco, but we saw him last as a very J.W. Pepper-esque sheriff in Superman 2. Carol Kane played Young Whore. This is an early role for her, but her second alongside Nicholson after Carnal Knowledge. Later, she appeared in Dog Day Afternoon, Annie Hall, and The Muppet Movie. She's possibly best known for her appearances opposite Andy Kaufman's Latka character on Taxi. She's in Princess Bride, Scrooged, Adam's Family Values. More recently, she was Lillian Kaustupper on The Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. I think that was Kimmy's Landlord, right? Yeah. She's also, she's also on uh, Strange New Worlds. Oh, right. Yeah. Michael Moriarty played Marine O.D. We'll see him next in Cue the Winged Serpent and later The Stuff and Pale Rider. He is also Harry Potter Sr. in Troll, but he's probably best known as Ben Stone in 88 Law and Orders. Luana Anders played Donna. Before this, she was Lisa in Easy Rider, and later she appears in Shampoo, Going South. She was also thanked posthumously by Jack Nicholson at the end of his acceptance speech for the Best Actor Oscar in As Good As It Gets. Kathleen Miller played Annette. She was Anjanette in Shampoo. Nancy Allen played Nancy. This was her first film. She's Anne Lewis in Robocop. She's also in Carrie, Home Movies, Dress to Kill, and Blowout for her husband at the time, director Brian De Palma. Patricia Hamilton played Madam. We saw her last as Mabel, the woman planning the Valentine's dance in My Bloody Valentine, who ends up in an industrial dryer. Derek McGrath played Nishiren Shoshu member. He was Dr. Benjamin Jeffcoat in 72 episodes of something called My Secret Identity. Gilda Radner played another Nishiren Shoshu member. We saw her last in First Family, and she's back next season in Hanky Panky, and later Haunted Honeymoon alongside husband Gene Wilder. Jim Horn played another Nishiren Shoshu member. He was an accomplished studio saxophonist who has performed on albums by three of the four Beatles, Beach Boys, Sinatra, Elvis, Harry Nilsson, Joni Mitchell, Michael Jackson, The Rolling Stones, Tom Petty, Toto, Billy Joel, and Diana Ross, among many, many others. John Castellano played another Nishiren Shoshu member. His only other credit is as an unnamed character from Mother's Day. And then the last credit here is for Gerald Ayers, the producer of the film, who plays a skater at the ice rink. And so far we've seen him write the scripts for Foxes and Rich and Famous from our backlog. I think that's everything for the last detail. If you have any thoughts you'd like to share, you can find all our socials at linktree slash vintage video pod. Thank you so much for listening, and we hope you'll join us tomorrow when we'll be discussing Magnum Force, which IMDb describes like so. Inspector Dirty Harry Callahan pursues a conspiracy of vigilante cops who are not above going beyond the law to kill San Francisco's undesirables. We leave you now with the trailer for Magnum Force. Eastwood is back in full force. 
as Dirty Harry in Magnum Force. Jimmy Riley, big time racketeer. Lou Guzman, narcotics king. What's happening? J.J. Wilson, well-known pimp. There are killers on the loose, dressed like cops. And they always use a magnum. You and your partner are back on homicide. It's a little dramatic, isn't it, Briggs? Not your usual style. It's meant to be, Callahan. Look, this thing might be bigger than even we think it is. This is the cream in the bottle, Callahan. Someone's trying to put the courts out of business. Look, you work with Briggs on this, Callahan. <laughs> They call him Dirty Harry, and he likes to do things his way. He's always around where the action is. In 24 hours, Harry manages to cover a stakeout, to stop a robbery, and to be a good neighbor. Hi. Oh, hi. You're the cop who lives upstairs. That's right. Killers that look like cops are after Harry because he knows too much. Whenever there's trouble, they always call in Harry because they know he'll do the job. It's all in a day's work for Inspector Harry Callahan. 